Hello, Lackers, and welcome back to the Third Age Babylon 5 podcast. We are three Europeans who are watching the show for the countless of times, for the second time, and for the first time. Um, and today we are going to be discussing an episode which title I have for them. And now forward. And now forward? <laughs> Yo, terrible. Yeah, anyway, okay. That's the episode we are going to be discussing today. But um, at first, of course, we are going to have our little introduction question for you to get to know us better. And our question today is, how would you decorate your quarters on Babylon 5? And I think we should also agree on for how long are we decorating. Are we like permanent stuff on the station? I, I think yeah. that's the idea. So as, as permanent stuff on the station, how would you decorate your quarters? Mike, do you want to start? Yeah, well, my my answer feels like it's the uh, an, an answer to a lot of questions uh, or a lot of um, an answer I would give to a lot of questions because it's books again. <laughs> um, but of course, that's a bit too few um, for for uh, decorating an entire room. Um, I would think about some things that uh, would bring more color in this room because it's quite yeah dark grayish almost boring uh, in its pre-made structure therefore I would try with I think plants of course um, may if, if that's if that's allowed I don't know maybe they say no you can't take flowers there because or plants because uh, you need water for them um, but maybe some some tapestry or something like that just to bring it more yeah like more color more of a cozy feeling um to get away from this this hard structures um of of steel and so on sounds like it's Depends, maybe maybe i would even be uh, try to be as crazy and uh, put something on the floor that it looks like uh, wood or something <laughs> like that the good old linoleum quarters Yes, sounds very cozy, definitely. Alex, do you want to go there? I, I think I'm somewhat in the same vein where making it cozy and look less like a, a spaceship would probably be a high priority. I, for me, it's a little bit ironic because I, I surround myself a lot of just sci-fi stuff, little little spaceships and such, which on the space station I, I don't really have to do. I can just go outside if I want to have space stuff. So I guess in that case, it would be more... And you know, trying to bring in some old timey as many pieces of wood as I can smuggle on the station conceivably. Like just having actual wood furniture seems like such a luxury to to have there. So something in that vein definitely. And then I I I, I want to have like a, a impressive centerpiece as Garibaldi's giant Daffy Duck, but I just don't know what that would be in my case. So it's 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 a bit up for debate. Interesting. So all three of you would definitely want to try to paint over the reality that we are on a space station, at least for your living quarters. I think I went to the exact opposite, actually, because of the, these 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 gray walls actually always remind me of a lot of brutalist buildings that we have. So that always has this super intellectual flair for me, maybe because, you know, these style of building from universities and schools and things like that. But I would definitely totally embrace that. I would not want to cover up the gray. I would also bring a lot of books because books, uh, we, we share that, that books are our everything that we bring everywhere. And I know that from when I'm traveling, that I always bring more books than I can read on the trip, actually, and then I buy new books wherever I am. Um, but also um, a lot of notebooks and things to work on and probably then I have these busy areas with books and notebooks and journals. And I would really then like to have this, I don't know, for me, it's always the 60s, 70s intellectual flair putting on this on this walls probably something like 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 posters like art modern art or something probably to feel like I'm back in art lessons when I was in school because yeah that's the flair for me so it would probably look a bit a bit psychedelic in the end but still have the space station flair and now that I talk about it I don't know how long I can live in that and feel sane but but yeah that's part of the flair I guess <laughs> that paired with the fact that everything is constantly spinning just sounds like a recipe for a very nice time I would probably at some point really, really be dismissive of my duties and become more of a, of a weird, weird writer, artist person. But that's my fate, whatever I do. So anyway. <laughs> very reliable, very responsible. 
Oh, another question for decor. I mean, it's not really decorating, but it kind of fits into it. Am I allowed to have a pet? I mean, we are not writing an entire fan fiction about the HOAs <laughs> on Babylon 5. I think you can just make that up. As yeah, so I, you know, so I need some kind of pet. I need something fluffy in the corner to talk to, to cattle with. Totally go there, too. If, if in some way possible, then... I mean, yeah. I already saw that somebody smuggled a Nakalin feeder on the station and it went unnoticed for weeks. I think you will manage to support a cat. It's going to be fine. I will smuggle a hamster. Ooh, the space hamster. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so that was our introduction question, so that you can get to know us a little bit better. Now I have to summarize this lovely episode without getting upset. Ooh, that's a challenge. In this episode, we are following around a journalist on her way on the station because we are watching a news broadcast that is um, featuring Babylon 5. So we have a journalist who has a lot of questions, a lot of typical of questions, and she meets our main cast. She talks to Sheridan, to, to uh, Londo, to, to all kinds of characters. And also, of course, as fate has it, she's not on the station on an ordinary boring day. She's on the station when actually an incident happens that we are now introduced to as, as, as visitors that just see the daily life of these people. Um, so maybe something to talk about later when we discuss that episode. We see it as this documentary showing, showing, showing their work. So we see Sheridan very, very uh, rational and very skilled in this situation. But actually, we can discuss if it was a big drama of it or if it was just a normal day. It's something we have to talk about later, because the big incident um, that's happening is that Narn shut down uh, a Centauri ship accusing it of carrying weapons to be used in the war against the Narn. And searches have uh, have uh, then find out that actually there were weapons on board. And so in the center, again, is this conflict between Narn and Centauri um, and the function the station has to play in between. And this very, very, yeah, um, critical and conflict loaded day we see from this journalist giving us the Earth perspective. Um, that is basically the plot. I think I shouldn't say more to it. I think that's it. So next thing on the list, I'm missing for one week, and again, I forget everything I have to say. Next thing is the first impressions. Yes, Michael, what's your first impression of the episode? Yeah, well, overall, I like this take of um, a news feed we get presented here because we have an entire new perspective here. And, of course, it is really strongly... Um, coded in the opinion or the view of this uh, journalist and honestly i hate her i really hate her <laughs> i can't there's there's no um no way around this because yeah well the let's say the kind of journalist she is um would usually be someone i would see um, yeah, in the in the trash news, in the yellow press, or something like that, because she, yeah, she she is not the the objective kind of of person. She should be, or at least she should, uh, as a journal as a good journalist, or what would we here would consider a good journalist um, would do. Just overall, I really like this because they, it gives so much more to the whole series, but this character, I, I think she will be the one on my most hated list, um, or maybe the most hated, depending um, what will come later, because, yeah, she, she is such a horrible person. Um, not Well, that's technically wrong. I don't know what she as a person is, but she's doing a really bad job. So yes, first of all, we agreed on talking about what is actually happening on the station. So we put aside for a moment that we are watching this journalist and this format, and we are really just talking about what is happening in our timeline and what is the plot for the show, what is the development and the crisis that we are aware of, and what does that mean for any further episodes. Um, so, I mean, what, what is basically happening is that we have, we have another confrontation that gets hot, between these two parties that are at war. We have the Narn attacking a Centauri ship, which of course puts the station into a difficult position because in front of their so-called neutral space, suddenly there's hot fighting actually, and it puts a lot of people at risk that are on the station. 
but also then we find out that the accusations are actually real. There is illegal weapon, tra weapon transport, and you know where these weapons go, that the Centauri transport, they are going to be used in the war. So what do we think about this? I, I think what struck me most about the, the opening of this is this is the first time I believe we see the war actually reach Babylon 5 to the point where in front of the station there is a firefight going on and we immediately see that even though this is a science fiction setting and you would think it's just spaceships blowing each other up so that's you know happening out there in the void we immediately also get told that no collateral damage is a real concern even if it's a space battle if there's Nan ships and Centauri vessels firing at each other. The station itself is shaking and getting damaged, and people have to go into shelter. So it really puts into perspective that war isn't this clean conflict between two parties, and everybody else can sit back and and enjoy the party. It's it's an issue that you can't really be neutral on by sit, by doing nothing. That doesn't work, which is is a lesson we keep learning in history over and over again. Yeah, and especially. After this incident, it just gets worse, I would say, to a certain degree, because then the Centauri think, hey, that's super good idea to put um, a, a Centauri battleship in front of Babylon 5 and make sure that no one gets out. Um, I, I don't know what, what kind of thinking this is. Um, it, it feels like, it, on one hand, a really desperate act of yeah we have to do something and this is the best they came up with um and on the other hand um yeah if, if you think putting bringing this this fight deliberately to babylon 5 um after the prayer accident i don't know really how to to feel about this because this is calculated death and destruction on a station that is considered or should be considered neutral ground. And in a way, this is also where we see this issue that was started with episodes like Gropos, where Earth Alliance was very openly utilizing Babylon 5 as a military installation to move troops around and such, because this certainly has damaged Babylon 5's position as a neutral ground if you know the, the earth alliance can ferry a whole bunch of military units through there why shouldn't the centauri be allowed to do the same like it, it weakens this mandate that babylon 5 is supposed to have and i think this is what we're seeing a little bit here and i i don't want to argue that the centauri are smarter than they are but I would give Sheridan a little bit of credit here in saying this move that the centauri did of blockading the station probably would have worked with a lot of other Earth Force commanders who would have been more timid and backed down at that point and, you know, not be like Sheridan the Starkiller who's just like, no, I I destroyed a Centaur uh, Minbari cruiser before. I'm not getting intimidated by this weird little ship that you have brought here. I, I think this is also us seeing him being just very bold in calling this bluff. Would you think Sinclair would have acted differently? Because I kind of can't see this. I think he would have... I, I don't see him backing down from this, but I also don't see him, you know, just using a drone ship and, and calling the bluff outright. Sinclair would expect to, I don't know, maybe negotiate something more that, the, that, that he basically puts pressure on the Centauri with the side of the League, that he tries to... To, to do something more through the council rather than than relying on Earth Force as much to, to do. I mean, maybe to bring up another point, what we definitely see here is that we have this ongoing conflict and we don't, I mean, we as the station, as uh, the, the um, all the different races on the station trying to negotiate and trying to secure peace, we don't have control over either of the parties in this war. We might have syntheses with one or the other side, whatever, but we don't have them under control and we don't have any binding laws or rules yet that can be used in these confrontations hmm. because, um, yeah, we are on completely new ground with having an intergalactic community. 
um, <clears throat> that was displayed very clearly that they just um, are in this very old conflict and just try to get their head through. I mean, you even see that in the end when you cannot keep them basically from destroying the others and themselves. So, um, yeah, that really shows that the, the power and the uh, the influence such an intergalactic place has is still very limited. It's an interesting take on describing Babylon 5 as kind of the UN in space like we did in, in season one, where in ways it's much weaker because it doesn't have the legal framework for anything like that. But locally, at least, it's also much stronger because if the legal way fails, Babylon 5 in this situation can just pull out the biggest stick and be like, no, if your ships are fighting each other, we're just going to fire on both sides until you stop, which at least temporarily works here. But you also immediately sh see why this isn't the solution that you could apply on a larger scale. It would not solve anything. I mean, as we said in, in season one already, we are in a situation where we see that something like a United Nations, but in space is needed mm. on the scale, but it is not there yet. So, um, yeah, there also is a question that she can have in mind when you watch it for the first time that I had in mind when I watched it for the first time was, is this going to be the war that is going to be such a disaster that something like the United Nations is, United Nations is going to be born, that we have, that we work on the legal framework that we have to accept or otherwise we cannot be an actor on the intergalactic stage. That's something to think about. But right now we are definitely seeing a lot of decisions being made for the very first time. And maybe we can take that and think about what, and what, yeah, what do we, what do we, what do you think are the implications and the consequences that this incident has? Because before we talk about the whole journalism format and its intention and whatever, but maybe let's look into the interview we had with this Earth guy. What was the senator on Earth? I have not memorized his name, but the senator. The senator, Earth guy. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Um, and his big argument was why everyone on Earth is so worried about keeping Babylon 5 in place is that these things happen in a place like that and it could mean that Earth is going to be dragged into a war. And my thought constantly was like, but how would you feel if these things happen above your head because we're in the same solar system somehow and you don't know what's going on because you're not a part of anything? The problem with this kind of, this, the, it's this door closing kind of, of thinking or, or like, yeah, I, I just build a wall and uh, then I, I won't have to do anything with this. This is the, the, the whole ground that this is, idea is built of is problematic because it's not solid. Because the idea of um, shutting a problem off just by well, it, basically, it's just like I ignore it and then it will, will go away or have nothing to do with me. The point is, if it's on Earth, you live on the same planet. If it's in Babylon 5 context, you live in the same universe. You just can't say, I ignored this. I don't want to be part of it because, yeah, just because you exist, you're part of this. And sooner or later in one way or another it will have an effect on you if it's um you transporting uh things and suddenly you can't transport um stuff through a certain a corridor of of um to i don't know some some colonies or anything um or you t suddenly no longer get to get resources you desperately need to build something or to keep people um save um get them food whatever you can't just ignore it because it it will have an effect and in a way the senator is being a perfect showcase example of why this position doesn't work because his response to all of these concerns you raise would be yeah but we have the biggest stick though we have rebuilt our fleet they, nobody can be dangerous to us which is a position that you could only have if you have not interacted and not seen the rest of the universe at all, which is Sheridan's immediate response to that is just saying, no, that's, that's a stupid idea to think that we could win the Membari War now or that we could take on the, the, the Centaurion or, or, or the Volons, let alone like that. But it, yeah, it creates the sense of security and 
for this senator to have this position makes a lot of sense if we look at the history that we've learned about Babylon 5 to this point. He views Earth Alliance still in the position that it was in after the Dilga War, where we are the newcomers on the stage, the, the galactic community had a problem and we fixed it for them. And now it is our responsibility to, you know, either step in and play the police of the galaxy or just not do that because we are the powerhouse of the galaxy. And he just chooses to ignore anything beyond that, which, yeah, it's it's from any other perspective than his own, a very childish thing to do. I have two things on this. Um, first, this idea of, yeah, we're, we're the, the big ones now, um, gives a bit of um, David with the versus um, Goliath vibes. Yes. Uh, where he is li like, oh, I'm I'm the great one, and then comes this little boy and just ends the story. Um, this is the typical overconfidence showcased here, um, and he is uh, the the positions uh, overall that were taken. Not just his interview. I think this is a bit from from Sheridan's interview as well. Um, he was talking about the the uh, Dilga war the humans mm. won and then is the point of yeah the Mimbari war we we didn't lose it um the the, the Mimbari were the ones um who put down the weapons so we won this this overall idea is is so stupid because well the overall the idea of that there is a winner and a loser in a war well that's completely different topic but um or more the, the case of is there really something like a winner in a war but the point here is that earth was the the, the earth alliance the the military was really really heavily destroyed there was not much left and to get to summarize all this and get to the idea of we won is um well bold would describe it um in in a rather um yeah horrible way where i would say go to a therapist because this is there's not no reality in this this is um wish thinking at at, at its best go to a therapist is a good is a good uh good thing here because this also definitely still shows the trauma of the war that we have talked about a lot in the first season that this surrender of the Mimbari came so suddenly and they are still not able to grasp it. Yeah. So we see that, for example, the... <coughs> Sorry. So we see that, for example, the reason why Sinclair was abducted in season one is still very much uh, a thing on Earth that we still have these big fractions that think that we could have won and anyone who has insight into it says, no, we could not have. It's, it's still also this issue that, you know, what he's doing is trying to rationalize something that just fundamentally doesn't make any sense. Like, as stupid as the idea is that Earth could have turned the tide of the war in this last second, to be fair, he's not offered any better explanation at any point. So it's kind of... They, 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 I think this is also what makes it difficult for somebody like Sheridan to rebuke that because, well, he can say, well, that, that can't be the reason. And then the senator just asks, well, okay, what is the reason then? Tell me, why did they surrender? Because they they did do that. So what's the reason behind that? And and you can't easily say, well, it's because of the soul journey, don't you know? <laughs> like, that's, it, it doesn't leave you. Which it is, I, I think, very um, typical for, for you know, reporting on more or less ongoing historical events and situations where sometimes you just have to accept that there isn't a good answer as much as you want to rationalize something that is convenient for you. And, yeah, that's difficult. That doesn't make for very good TV. Well, what I am wondering right now is how the actual uh, information um, is about the Mimbari War. Like, mm. what do the normal people on Earth were told after this or even now? Did they really get the the reality handed down to them in, in like, the, the not just death tolls, but also what was lost, how many um, ships were destroyed, and um, yeah, well, what Earth Alliance managed to do, which is basically nothing. Um, 
people on earth are in a very bad position here to, to learn anything because from their perspective, this is what we learned through, uh, through Sinclair, they hear about this war is going on and humanity is losing. We are losing colonies. Okay, so that's bad. But then over the last stretch of the war, the Mimbari bypassed most of the colonies in the solar system and went straight to Earth. Okay, everybody knows this. So the Earth colonies in the solar system are mostly fine. And then there is this big final battle of the line on top of Earth. And the Mimbari don't ever invade. They just go away after that. It's not that hard for somebody to put the spin of this. Well, okay, this must mean there was a big final battle. And we won. What else is there to say? Why else would they have gone away? And I think Earth Alliance doesn't really need to do a lot more than just handing down these factual pieces of information and let everybody else come to their own conclusion about that. And it's just this very convenient story. Yeah, that's that's the point. They, It feels like, to me, it's just like, Okay, basically, we would have lost to Earth was was this short before destruction, but for some reason, we we didn't die. Um, we don't know why this is, but maybe if we don't talk about it, no one will ask questions, and we're. But I mean, voila. the issue is, why would people on Earth get to the realization that they were this close to death? They sit in a solar system where all the solar no, no, colonies I, are fine. No, um, no, no, I, I don't. Oh, mean from the, the perspective of the high ups who actually knew how yes, bad it yes, was. Yes, that's, that's all right. I was and it's it's, it's yeah. like just let's just put it under the rug so no one will ask. Hopefully, uh, ask any questions, hmm. and that's it. I, they are what what is happening here with with um, the Membari War. That yeah, it's like yeah, nothing happened. Everything is fine. It Let's just talk same. about it. Uh, as as we as we talked about also in the first season, another good comparison actually is uh, to compare it to the situation how World War One ended for Germany, where also there always was this myth of uh, if there would not have been a surrender, we could have won. And if you look at it from a military perspective, then no, no one could have won. But this thing survived and also was a big motivator to even start World War Two. In the end, so um, um, yeah, these unanswered questions um, surrounding such a trauma after a war always uh, have a, have a, have a bad backfire. Yes, and I mean, if we look at the the World War One example, this is how you get this rationalizations. If somebody does find out how bad the war actually went, this is their second layer of defense of just you know dealing with that that way. It's very easy not to ask any questions about this history because nobody is going to benefit from that inside of, of that nation, inside of this government apparatus. And so this this entire apparatus just, you know, reinforces this idea just not to talk about it. And if I look at this Earth Alliance senator, I genuinely don't know if he is having this calculus of, you know, just denying reality that he knows about, or if it's literally the case that he only ever looked at the official story and never used his security clearance as a senator to to poke any more holes in this because how would he ever benefit from that? That is not that he has no incentive to do that. Which yeah, is it's terrible. like overall, don't don't touch um, uh, a functioning structure. Yes, yes. Um, and well, or, or well, the the functioning structure I would would put in, in um, with a with a question mark because well, there's. The problem here is that um, since we know a lot more than is pre presented here for, for the Earth Alliance, it's like, yeah, um, how do I phrase this? Um, we, we overall know that there is so many things that could go even worse with not knowing the whole story um, because since this this yeah let's keep the structure um is based on on a wrong idea and gives off wrong interpretations that would leave would lead even to um more difficult and problematic decisions and perspectives in the future and even though knowing a truth may be um uncomfortable but overall it puts you in a better position um 
to look into the future or prepare for the future. Um, funnily, this is overall um, the same idea of, of uh, psychotherapy. I mean, you're, you're sitting down, looking at all the problems. It's super uncomfortable. You cry, you weep, you get angry. But the overall idea is that if you go through this, you, you yeah, can close your wounds. You can have a better view into the future. And basically, that's that's the the structure we have here with Earth Alliance and the overall humanity, or most part of it, with this really, really broken and, um, yeah, I, I don't know, really turned perspective of reality. But I think this is also the case where it's significant that we get the contrast here between a senator or a politician talking about the war and how another war would go and Sheridan as a military commander, how this would go. Because taking this, you know, alternate reality view of, oh, we could win another war with the Membari if, if it started now, is a terrible way of dealing with reality if you ever actually want to be in a position of dealing th with this problem, you know, dealing with another conflict with the Membari realistically. But that's not what the senator wants. The senator is talking about this in terms of politics. And I think this is, you know, ironically why he is probably genuinely a big fan of Babylon 5, because Babylon 5 preventing a war with Membari means this bluff will never be called. And then it can be... Yes, but ironically, it would make sense for him to be that. And, you know, he does have this ambivalent view in his interview of saying, you know, well, we should keep this this uh, legacy of Santiago going. So he's not, you know, and as anti-Babylon 5 as he could be in his interview. And I think part of that is that he 100% only talks this much bullshit about the Membari because he is convinced that this will never actually be put to a test. At least I would hope that, otherwise he's just an idiot, which would make for an interesting <laughs> character at all. But it's a it's thing, you know, in, in a real world with the long-term plan of having Elvaline succeed his logic makes no sense at all, but as a politi in just in the political sphere that he represents, it does. And you can see how that collides with the reality that Sheridan lives in. I also found it interesting, now that we had the topic open of Sheridan's interview, that he, he, di he didn't join in that discussion about the victory. He didn't say anything against it. He just looked at her. He, he realized where she was in the conversation, her opinion, and just nodded and said, right. Just he had he had the, the defenses up and the situation under control. I I enjoyed seeing that. Yeah, because yeah. I know that I don't have myself under control when I'm annoyed by people. So I really enjoyed <laughs> seeing that. Yes, well, and overall, it's it's the best thing that he could have done in this situation because otherwise, even if you leave this whole uh, soul thing out to really get to a person to make her understand uh, what things are really like this is a really heavy task and takes quite long especially because he just knows it's not going to air then like if he yeah. starts going off on some weird conspiracy theory about how the war really ended they're just not going to show it no matter what kind yeah. of journalist they are so it's just also not going to be productive at all so yeah this is sheridan the tactician being able to pick his battles and deciding this is not worth a hill to die on as much as you might want to and I think quite quite naturally, we, we are around about the half hour mark now. We are getting to the point... To what point? That we are looking at this through the lens of ice. No, not yet, because there's one more thing we have to talk about when we talk about what actually happened okay. in this episode. We have to ask ourselves what this means for further interaction with this conflict, because we have seen that... We as a station definitely do not have the par the parties of this conflict under control. Yeah. We, they they are in front of our noses and do whatever they want or whatever they think is right, and uh, maybe also judge a little bit of what they are doing and why they are doing it. I mean, especially from the non side, you could think, for example, that it was a bad move to attack two Centauri ships, although although in the second you were actually directly told to stand down. But then on the other side, they did that with the risk of destroying themselves and they all died in the end. And I think it's it, it was, what we have seen here was just another move of complete desperation. Of course, it was a big risk of losing more sympathies in the galaxy. But 
the only goal that they had in mind here was actually destroy the weapons, do anything to destroy the weapons to have less weapons in the war at home, even if it meant dying for that. And um, that is is some, something that I can fully and completely understand, but it makes dealing with the Narn, um, as someone who is in CNC on the station, a lot more dangerous. Especially because for all the sympathies for the Narns you have, there is always this argument to be made, but why does it have to happen like right here on the neutral ground? Why can't you intercept these ships at any other point? Why do you have to put this neutral place into jeopardy? Yeah. I mean, of course, you could say that they probably normally intercept them somewhere else because it doesn't happen every day. Mm. This was just a desperate move. But true, yeah. So it is on the other hand, on the other hand, from their perspective, from, from the Narn perspective, they just knew that the Centauri would put her, their guard down because this is yes. neutral ground. It's like, yeah, we just seize the uh, opportunity no matter how much damage we do in this moment to ourselves. And also we can ask the same questions the Centauri. This is neutral ground. Why the fuck do you bring this weapons here? Yeah. Why are you doing that? I mean, you, you also you put people at risk because transporting weapons is dangerous. Transporting transporting weapons illegally is more dangerous, and you bring a war zone to the station. What the hell? And then yeah, in this as, case, as, both just fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> but with all things, if we talk about the Centaurian non-war, one is doing this very you know questionable act as the party getting absolutely obliterated right now. The other one is doing it as the party who is in a power position and absolutely winning this war right now. Like It's going to be much harder to justify for the Centauri. Why do you need this one weapons shipment right now through Babylon 5? You are winning this conflict already massively. It would have delayed you maybe a little bit, but there is no stake that would justify this compared to what the Narn could argue for. Yes, so there's definitely more sympathy for the Narn, but it also seeing what the Narn are ready to sacrifice makes dealing with them very risky. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, just as a side note on this, it's also interesting that this is an inversion of the same plot that we heard before. We already had the Centauri claiming that the Narn were smuggling weapons on civilian vessels, and now it's the other way around. It's also just, once again, not making the equivalency between the two, but just the fact that, yeah, everybody's kind of thrown out. It's, it's not... I mean, we're gonna stop. They learn from each other over centuries, so they have the same techniques. Yeah, a big surprise. <laughs> well, I have to say, what really annoyed me was when um, the the uh, Centauri with their second vessel with this this mm. whole um, yeah we we won't let anyone uh, get out of here um, when this was. Um, yeah, after it was destroyed, I think there is this short interview with Lando and he is saying, yeah, why, why did the Narn do this? It was just, it was uh, when we did something peaceful. I, I don't know the, the exact uh, words, but peaceful certainly was one of them. Uh, I was like, peaceful, you, you were threatening the whole station. You were threatening everyone leaving there. Yeah, right, please. Including the Centauri living there, by the way, you know, it's, it's <laughs> like not even following it was just hard. But, um, um, yes, so what do, so what, as so one of the final points before we go over to the journalist format, um, what do we think are the consequences and the implication of this incident? Or do we think that, I mean, we've seen this through a different lens in this episode, of course, we've seen it through the lens of this journalists so we have seen them just being competent and dealing with their daily um challenges but was this a more dramatic moment than we have seen before was this like a really uh, uh um climax of the conflict so far or was this just daily life of what can happen to you when you are stationed there? You... i don't think it's a coincidence that this is the plot we see unravel through the lens of ISN, because I, I think as implications, what's happening here is that Babylon 5 forces Earth Alliance to either acknowledge that this is a precedent, that Earth Alliance will now, you know, use weapons to enforce neutrality if necessary, or if Earth Alliance steps further into isolation. And I believe this is such a big decision that will now have to be made on the side of Earth Alliance that affects everyone watching this program. 
And I, I, I think this is just a clever little thing that they did here that, yeah, the, the probably one of the things happening on Babylon 5 that affects Earth Alliance the most is portrayed to us through this lens of something that everyone in the Earth Alliance can see. So this is like a turning point. De definitely a turning point. Like, once again, like Earth Alliance has to either say this was in our interest, so we endorse what Babylon 5 did here, but that has the massive implication that now Earth Force vessels will fire on non and Centauri ships that engage in this kind of activity, or they explicitly have to say what Sheridan did wasn't representative of what the Earth Alliance does, which is also a big deal because that means, you know, the entire station went rogue for a little bit. Yes, but overall, Earth Alliance say, said, Sheridan, go for it. Mm, yeah. and, and therefore, we, we have finally um, a standing point of Earth Alliance in this conflict because so far, they didn't have one. They were just like, okay, okay, we just stand on the sidelines, do your shit, we um, will just watch. Um, and here it was, yeah, just do, th do something or you... Or you may get in the position of being run over in the future. Yes. And I think overall they didn't really had a choice here of not doing anything. So um that Yeah, be... they they made a stand of okay, if you push us to the point um or, or try to push us to, to a wall, we will act and yep. I think this was overall good thing for Earth Alliance to show the people at home, like, hey, we, we are not getting pushed around like the kids in, sh in school. Um, but also uh, in, um, yeah, representation to the other uh, species out in the universe. Like, yeah, we may have had our problems uh, in, in uh, the past, but we will not back down. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe with this two eyes in, is it? it. Oh, yes, awesome. yeah. All right. So maybe the ISN. Um, yeah. What 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 would we call this one? It's it's not a regular news feed like like the daily news. Uh, maybe just to get this categorized a bit better to see what actually is it what we're talking about here. I believe they call it the special report 36 hours on Babylon 5. Yes, it reminds me of these things that you can catch on any 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 uh, TV channel that has a kind of news department when you, you have already watched the daily news and then two or three hours later there is a special thing on mm. something where a reporter does some special story. Yeah. Um, well, I, I wouldn't, if I have to um, think of some uh, TV channels that would bring something like this out. I can't think of um, like the the public um, state funded um, channels we have here in Germany. I, I'm not sure if this is just my impression, but you think there's more? It would be on RTL, Fox, something like that. Yes, yes, more on the. Um, privately owned that you want to catch up on story, but are not as neutral in their premise. I think... Yes, you summarized this perfectly because it's like they notice me, hello, look at me, uh, and having some, some yeah, like like really catchy um, description or, or um, title or maybe even if you think about like on, on YouTube with, with the pictures, like something just like there, where, where overall you think, okay, this could be clickbait. In a way, Babylon 5 has a weirdly unique media landscape like this because it is a universe where there is just this one big news station. So it's, it's unlike, you know, your typical US uh, idea where, you know, you have one big per partisan issue essentially this is just one big news station that speaks to everything but it still is flavored in the style of something that isn't public broadcasting it feels very privatized and like you put it so nicely so hey hello hi hi we are doing we are doing something great here 
and this might be just to the, down to the fact that, yeah, it's it's limited how much information you can get across. So there is just this one news station that everybody is into. But yeah, it, it is. I, it feels like people only watch this because it is literally the only thing on. Which feels really weird to me to have just one type of, of news channel. I mean, um, we, we've seen that there are like newspapers and stuff that are different, but I, I, I legitimately think this might be down to the technical limitations of the universe. Getting like a news feed across the galaxy is, is probably very difficult. I imagine on like most places like Mars or Proxima, you know, colonies that have their own infrastructure, they would have local news stations and then the one big interstellar one. But because Babylon 5 is too small to have that on its own, it's just kind of that one channel. And also that probably relies on a lot of funding. And I am not sure if ISN is actually state funded at all. Or if it is more relying on, 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 on personal private funding. Well, luckily, a uh, advertisement segment was included in this episode. That's, that's, that's the thing. We had this horrible, horrible uh, advertisement of uh, the cycle news. And I mean, is that... And we forgot that one. <laughs> yes. And I mean, if that is actually the case, if Psychor funds them to a certain degree and because they show this commercial... Then I think Psychor also has an idea of what kind of content they want to be placed within it. Yes. So I think it's not like there's a real censorship going on, but that there's definitely this thing that some, with some formats and with some opinions, you have more problems placing them than with other. It's this horrible situation where it is state funded, just specific agencies that are part of the state funded individually which seems like the worst of both worlds it's like being privatized and state-owned at the same time amazing yes because on the on the other hand it, it, uh, on one hand it, it gives you this this feeling of oh it's it's uh something official and at the same time it's it's so um yeah biased molded by these agencies just what they in in the way they want it to like yeah, practically it's the the worst kind of of um, state owned um, channel. It's it's like yeah, I, I'm I'm thinking of like yeah, the cold cold war. Like okay, we give you just the news we want you to hear, yeah. so you have our opinion or you have the opinion we want you to have. Um, and at the same time, also with the weird flavor of being privatized so that the state controls it, but doesn't actually want to fund it. So this is, so it looks just kind of cheap and unprofessional in places, which I, I, I imagine it might also be down to the fact that sending Cynthia Talkman to Babylon 5 is probably not the new story of the day. I, there might be just at play that Babylon 5 is also just kind of a kind of a distant place that they just send somebody to and, and see if something... Like, imagine if this was just a normal day on Babylon 5 and not a big space battle had happened. I feel like this would be a report that, you know, would really pull all that many numbers because people aren't that super interested in Babylon 5 on the get-go. And yeah, that would probably be like, here is a weather station somewhere in the in the, in the the Baltic Sea and people are like, yeah, okay, it's remote. That's this weird backwater experiment with aliens that we did that one time and nothing happened. Um, yeah. Do we want to include here maybe our general discussion that we had about neutralism in general? Because I think, oh. I, think I mean, maybe maybe for this episode, it, it, on, for when we discuss the interviews in more detail, it might be interesting to remember that this was made for the American market where the situation is a little bit different and the perspective on journalism is a little bit different than here in in Europe, in Western Europe and mm. Germany, I think. Um, maybe we should address that a little bit. I think it definitely comes in a very specific time frame also where the Cold War is just about, or, you know, the, the media landscape of the Cold War is just about winding down. And there is, you know, this is somebody who has a journalistic background writing essentially about the worst parts of that journalism. And I think we get an interesting mix here of just people being unprofessional 
people being willfully manipulative and all of this being framed in like we just talked about this weird version of a kind of public state ish controlled but also privatized like news network that just embodies the worst of everything and maybe we should also man this is a philosophical question but maybe we should talk about it for a moment before we talk about the interviews and the bias because just beforehand, I totally agree this person has bias, but also I think this person is a little provocative to get the target audience with the, with the bias that she brings with herself, which is a bad combination. But um, because what, what I see more and more is that, for example, we have, we in Germany, we have our state-funded journalism that um, wants to be neutral, um, but that is more and more under attack from groups on the extreme sides of the political spectrum. Because um, it is difficult to just be neutral because, for example, when you have reports on on crisis, on on wars, on on whatever, um, you have in this state of journalism, of course, journalists who accept the basic human rights, who accept the United Nations, who accept the authority of the European Union and things like that. And then, of course, when you have that as your basic idea and then you give a report on, for example, um, a refugee situation that we have, constantly at the moment, then for them on the extreme end, you are not neutral anymore. And that is just, I think, a, a constant problem journalism in general is under. And then, of course, you have formats that just decide for one end of the spectrum to be more communicative with them. And I think that's important to keep in mind. I think the overall um, point of, of all this is that neutrality or, or um, non-personal Oh no, no, let me let me start again. Um the overall idea is to try to achieve a neutral position. Of course, you never manage to be completely neutral because well, you are a person um with specific standards and everything. So, but the idea is um to get as closely to this point as possible. Of course, you have to, to think about what is the ideal basis that is considered to be, yeah, or, or what is the ideal basis that is in, in the country the, the journalist is coming from. Um, and yeah, like the human rights, if you think of, of uh, yeah, I would hope most of countries in the world, but unfortunately it's not. Um, the case but like the human rights should be something non-negotiable like th there is no opinion of um uh, uh, if, if you say that someone is um breaking these human rights and in, in um if you have like yeah point this out this is not an opinion or personal opinion you are giving there it's just giving the facts and those on 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 the on the uh, outer scale of of um, yeah the spectrum that are going against this, like oh yeah, that's that's not neutral. I don't think they really understand the idea of being neutral because they have such an extremist um, opinion on their own, um, but do not really realize that it's an opinion. And it has nothing to do with the with the basis of uh, or the ideal of the the country or whatever they come from. I think an interesting question to ask is in this context also: What does ISN understand as being an objective kind of report? Because with this episode and the reporter that we saw in season one, I think there is a pattern here where for ISN. Making an objective report means making an authentic report. And authentic to them means I have a reporter in the field in the moment, talking to the people who are involved. And as much as we rag on ISN, rightly so, and as annoying as these reporters are, just on paper, I get where you could get this idea, that you have this idea, if I want to know how a war is going, I send somebody to the front line and ask the people who are actually fighting what's going on. If I want to know how a crisis is happening, 
I sent Cynthia Talkman into the corridor where Franklin is desperately trying to save lives and shout questions at him. And there you see where it breaks down because I I think one of the fundamental problems what annoys all of us so much is that ISN doesn't believe in research. If ISN forms an opinion on any issue, it sends its reporters directly into the crisis situation, shouting at people random questions with the justification the people have a right to know, and that's then what you get. And there isn't any context provided. There isn't any research that steps back and then tells you a little bit about what's actually going on, because that, I guess, to them wouldn't feel authentic enough. And I, I think it's an interesting thing where on paper, the idea doesn't even sound that bad. You talk to the people in the moment, but then the execution is absolutely horrible because it forgoes anything that would allow you, for example, to make a connection to something more fundamentally objective, like trying to make a context. What what does this mean in the context of human rights uh, legal, uh, legal issues? Yes, but also then if you say, say that they want an authentic one um, uh, like that, the other thing that they want to have very authentic is their idea of what other questions the completely normal uh, uh, next door person on earth has. And um, I th also think that many of the moments where at first I thought this journalist is biased was just where she <laughs> was acting out her opinion of what the normal earth citizen would think and provokes her um, interview partner with these kind of opinions. If everyone on earth actually has the same bias, or if that even is a majority, I think that's still open because um, 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 m many, m many parties still want to try to play that out against each other, but in a population it's always more layered. But that's also the thing. She wants to be super authentic. I'm the normal earth person who has never left the planet and is confused by all the things you do up here. And she's acting that. And I think especially in TV, there is also this idea that, you know, getting a, you know, getting the land to cry is an authentic situation because people relate to that. It's for me on the same level as reality TV. Like everybody knows it's scripted, but when people break down on camera and shout at each other, it feels very authentic. It has the veneer of being real because the camera is shaky and there isn't really a coherent script to anything and it all feels very improvised and i think this is also like getting a big reaction out of dylan is worth more to isn than than doing anything else to the point even where i don't know if isn has a big political agenda behind making these points or if it's literally just about if this alien cries right now that's more clicks for us I don't yes. know like yeah. where on this is once again where I don't know if this is the state owned part of the channel being terrible or just the privatized profiteering part being terrible. Probably this is a synergy of both, which is the worst kind. Um, maybe before we go uh, deeper in, in uh, to um, any of the concrete um, interviews, back to the the scene where um, yeah, the the reporter runs after. Um, Franklin, where all the, the hurt people are lying around, some of them shortly before dying, and um, it just kicked really hard when, when uh, Leila, you said um, this, this like, I am an old person, and the people, they have the right to know um, the answer, uh, or, or the, the, the answer to this question, I'm shouting at you, um, where I just thought, in this especially in this situation no at this moment they don't have any fucking rights the people that have rights are those that are hurt yes. that are bleeding that are dying those are the ones that are important here and yeah honestly that was the moment i, the, I think this is rather um um and early yeah, it's quite early, early. Uh, I, really wanted to jump in there take uh, the 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 camera the the microphone whatever equipment they had and beat them to a pulp because in this situation where the there are lives at stake to think to have the odyssey to think i am more important than these lives 
Yes, and also just the result you're taking when I was when I'm screaming something. I mean, I've never done that, but when I would be screaming something like that at a doctor in that situation, I would be scared that I confuse him and then he does a mistake or something. Yes, that would be the next thing. So the the patience that Franklin has here, I wouldn't have. I would have shouted back at this person to shut the fuck up and to go back in her her I don't know hole or or underneath the rock she came from. And it's, it's once again, I think this example of on paper, the people have a right to know, isn't a terrible idea. Yes, you know, people should have a way of knowing what's going on if the station is under fire and stuff. It doesn't give you the right to run at the, at the doctor screaming. There is no reason why people would have to find about it this way. You could just read the report and then report on that. It's it's perfectly viable. And especially, it's not like it's a live feed. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> together. She could, she could have fucking waited, like, I don't know, half an hour, an hour or even longer. But it's then you not don't have this, at this moment. Then you don't have this genuine and authentic emotional yeah, reaction, though. Of course, of course you could have... Um, caught this this whole um scene on on camera even though i think this isn't right because yeah people that are just um hurt and and bleeding and can't make a decision if they want to be on camera um is overall wrong to me but if you just have to do this because you're a fucking asshole then okay do it but don't ask questions like you're the most important person in the fucking universe i mean to to a lesser degree this also just reminds me of you know crisis reports in the real world where if you know a city is currently under fire or getting devastated by a hurricane the news station is just that we have a correspondent there to speak on that like really why that uh, this person probably is something better to do right now everybody there is something better to do right now than, than to report just so that you have the nice like local background. I mean, maybe that's also just an old-fashioned way of journalism because I think that um, um, this authenticity was maybe very important um, a few years ago, but I think now we, we more and more realize that, I mean, as I'm a correspondent in Ukraine right now and I'm there doing an air raid, giving an interview or whatever, and I get hit and then the hospital has to treat me, I mean, just one more person being a burden to them. I don't have to be there, you know. Yeah, it's, it's not a useful perspective at that point anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I... but it's again, it's it's, it's about about the viewers. Of, of I mean, there of course there are contexts where the, all of this makes sense. Um, but then there are a lot of other things that are unnecessary that are really just ego driven. Um, I, I go back to to the car accident thing. Mm. If the accident happened, like when when uh, the, the ambulance comes, the police is there. Why would you hold a camera on this scene? There, you, you, there is nothing you can record that would help in this situation. It's just like, oh, there's 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 a, a hurt person, a dying person, maybe even a dead person. Uh, and I'm just filming this for my own personal, um, I don't know, kick or, or something, my personal fetish. Um, and yeah, the people that put this even out in on the internet and everything, there's something, in my opinion, fundamentally wrong with them. But I think the... a key difference there is if you have the car crash example, the, one of the key reasons for you not to be there and filming is that we have systems in place to deal with that situation. They, it is taken care of. I think where the balance becomes interesting with 36 hours on Babylon 5 is that there are things happening. There is this war going on and Earth citizens, Earth civilians are involved in this now. And I'm not sure if Earth Alliance is equipped to deal with this thing. I want as many people as possible watching ISN to pay attention to this because I'm not sure that Earth Alliance as it is right now is going to make smart decisions about this. But I think we have right now um, lots of a little bit of an angle because I think the, the, the example that Mike here had in mind was just the moment where yes, the journalist course. ran to Franklin, one of the sick is... people, and there I want to maybe... Um, 
changed the subject a little bit because um, we wanted to start with the Dylan interview, but maybe can we? Because now we had this angle of this I am the normal Earth person asking one of the Earth questions. So can we maybe talk about the Franklin interview and also about the stuff that Franklin was talking in that interview? Can we maybe start with that now that we have this normal Earth person issue here? I, I think what we're getting at is this problem where we want people to pay attention to this to some degree for some reasons, but what is it worth? Like, is it worth the journalist running into the sick bay? Definitely not. Is it worth making the land cry? Definitely not. Is it worth... Yeah. So can we well, say there's a proper way to do it and there is a not proper way and the way she is doing it is yeah in the letter spectrum so franklin in very good shape yeah well just admired <laughs> i was a fan <laughs> here <laughs> i never thought i would say this but yeah in, in this but moment <laughs> Uh, honestly, I, I don't remember that precise his interviews, but uh, um, overall, um, I would say that, yeah, he, he is giving a, a few really good points uh, there that it's important to save everyone and stuff like that. Yes, that part. Yes, the first part. I think he... For me, it feels like he's been waiting for this interview all his life <laughs> and has been keeping his anecdotes for all his life. And as much as I appreciate the actual message that he's trying to give here, he, for me, he comes across a little bit too melodramatic about Tw it. Towards to like, the end, at least. When he gets very visceral about... Yes. And I think it loses it loses control at some point because what Alex and I were talking about in his last examples, just of a normal person on Earth, a person who has never left Earth cannot imagine just how dangerous the space is, for example. Alex was saying, well, we have ships. And you know, if I sink in the middle of an ocean, even if I am, have never made that journey, I know why it is dangerous. And I mean, even if I'm not on a plane, I know why I cannot open a window while I'm flying on a plane. So that point was a little bit awkward for us. I, I think to summarize, for me, it felt a little bit like he started off really strong and then near the end, his God complex started kind of creeping into it where he was lifting everything to he is the only person who truly understands what's going on here, where he I loses the but he then always has this this view on on people have to 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 people who never made this journey people who never ha were in this situation just cannot imagine it. you cannot learn how dangerous space is just by understanding what a vacuum is you have to be there you have to have this spiritual journey basically and yeah i mean i i, I kind of get an idea if you or at least i i think i have um, if you compare this, the, the situation being on a ship uh, on the sea and being on a ship um, in space, technically, your chances are good that if you fall off a ship, you're not immediately dead. You can be saved. But that's not the case in space. And also not on a plane if I open a window. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's this thing where, yes, of course, there are significant differences here. Uh, and they, they, this is why I'm saying, like, I don't disagree with what Franklin is saying per se. Just, you know, his presentation of it is kind of, I would call it fear mongering, like t making out space as this incredibly dangerous thing where, I mean, yeah, g getting into hard vacuum is very dangerous. But on the other hand, you know, he, he portrays it like, man, if like one micro asteroid hits Babylon 5, it's going to implode and everybody's going to die immediately, which is just not the case. And also just that he's, he 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 accuses anyone on Earth who has never made this journey to not be aware of this danger and not know about this danger, which I just think is an assumption that you cannot make. That is someone just because they have not been there are not interested in it or cannot understand it. And on the other hand, then also if people who just live their life on Earth or even people who make space travel are not constantly aware of every risk and every danger. And that's a problem that I sometimes have with a group of with, uh, various people. Like, like um, um, if I'm constantly aware of, of, of the risk of eating anything sweet or anything unhealthy or whatever, or of any illness that I could get, it's like, yeah, 
I cannot be constantly aware of it because I have to live in this body and not go crazy. So, you know, it's always this, they don't have an idea of this. Maybe they block it out because it's their way of living, you know? I, it's, it's, you know, he's a doctor. He's, he's obviously making it his job to talk, to talk and think about this. Yes, but it's his job and not mine. Yeah, you know, that's, that's the point that's, here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, maybe I'm, I'm giving Franklin here too much credit or at least that it's, it's something I hope he, he is trying to say that, um, or at least in, in, in his position, I would try to make the point folks space is far more dangerous than you make it out. Um, I, I could think of, uh, or I would imagine the, that people take it a bit too lightly because yeah, well, we traveled, um, for such a long time on earth and yeah, we had our catastrophes, but, um, we, we, um, yeah. We were, we were getting better and better. Our ships were getting better. Our planes were getting better. We had better ideas of how the sea works, how the current is, how the weather works and stuff like that. And um, that overall there are far more um, things in space that are not that well known. Um, and, but, and maybe, well, okay, we could say it doesn't matter where a tragedy happens, where someone loses his life. It's always something um, that should be seen and acknowledged at, uh, as what it is. Um, but I think that's, or I would feel this is actually the point he is trying to make, but he is not really managing it well because he is playing uh, the most important role in this case. And that's just not working if you try to make a, uh, to give a message people to focus on yourself but i think also when he that i mean his big point in the end is this message and i think that to me that also showed that the journalist was acting out as this normal earth citizens having all of these big bias questions and this also showed very much that uh that franklin has his own bias against earth people because they have not been enlightened like he is so that's just one side two sides of one coin i think I mean, to, to the point that you're making, Mike, uh, I feel like this is an uh, this this is a speech that I think Jakar would be much better equipped to give me. I remember him talking about you know, being in space is like being the ants getting picked up from a flower and just being confronted with unknowable things. I think for for me, the main issue with Franklin's speech is that he's giving a really bad example because he talks to me about this airlock where a kid accidentally gets stuck in, presses the wrong button and is now sucked into space, at which point I'm not thinking about the dangers of space. I'm thinking that is a really poorly constructed door that has not a, <laughs> not a single security feature on that. And that just undercuts the entire point. And, you know, it, you are completely right in saying, yeah, but that's not what he's like. That's not the point of the story that he's telling. That's, you know, on my part, kind of willfully misunderstanding him because it's funny to me. Nope. But it, that's that's the communication skill, right? If if Jakar tells me this in a metaphor about uh, uh, about uh, ants, I I get it better, which might not be universal. Yes, but also, I mean, I guess for me, it's also a bit of this. I mean, at this point of a speech, in the in the beginning, he doesn't have that. But at this point of a speech, where he drifts off into his god complex, as we mm. called it, it's a bit of this accusation that he has for other citizens of Earth. Um, and then I always, yeah, I mean, I, I never like it when spiritually touched people have these accusations for for anyone else because it's always like, I, I would assume that when someone is not aware of something that has a lot of meaning to me, it is for a reason because people who can function usually are good in sorting information and also sometimes blocking out risks because, of course, if I am a doctor, I have to be completely aware of what can all happen to a body if it was exposed to vacuum because I have to treat these people. So I have to be constantly aware right? if I construct these airlocks. I should construct a job that doesn't do this, for example. But if I am just a passenger who wants to go to another colony, I cannot constantly focus on what can go wrong on my journey. Oh, I might not board that at all, that uh, that spaceship at all. I just have to listen to people who tell me what not to do and wait until I arrive. And what's wrong with that? I think nothing. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I just found on his, yeah. Um, just I uh, wanted to say because um, Alex, you uh, made the reference to Jakar. 
maybe we shouldn't forget Jaka is ambassador. He yep, should know course. how to talk. Of course. And Franklin is a doctor, so um, I, they don't just have bad handwriting. Uh, they don't necessarily know how to talk to people. They just know how to treat them. But I think in a way, this is the perfect showcase. I, you know, we, we, we are going on this a little while now, I think for good reason, because Franklin, I believe, is the perfect interview for Cynthia Talkman. I think this is the one that really gets across because ultimately it fully plays into this idea that to get an authentic idea of what space is like, you talk to the doctor who is in space. I, I believe it would have been much more useful to, you know, do research on how dangerous space is and then report on that because the doctor might not have the communication skills, but you can see why it is appealing. And then you get to this doctor and he thinks everyone on Earth is a little bit ignorant to the danger of space, surely rightly so uh, to some extent. But, you know, then it just reinforces this idea that, yeah, that's the right way of doing it. The only way to really learn about space is to go there. And so people kind of get stuck in this loop of, okay, I just have to keep watching ISN because they keep talking to the people who know what's up. It's it's a good way of validating this entire format inadvertently. Mm -hmm. Or, of course, you listen to the psychop who explains to your child that he's a psychic <laughs> and, and everything is really good and just talk to the nearest psycho office in your area. So let's be fair, Franklin had a good start, but his underlying issue that we keep talking about also came through a little bit. He's not a good science communicator, which is fine because that isn't his job. He should, he doesn't need to be. <laughs> um, quick question. Um, do we want to talk about each of no, the interviews? Because this is way this too is, much, this, I would this say. This would be way too much. But we should go to the land and talk about her, I definitely. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, we already okay. talked a bit about Sheridan's interview. Mm. And I don't think that um, the other interviews are, even if we have interviews with Jakar and Lando, I'd, to me, they didn't feel that deeply interesting. It, it made a good thing overall. And I really liked to see uh, Kosh closing the door of us. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh God! I, I I so felt him in this moment. I would have done the same. So yeah, I what I what I really liked. Um, oh, sorry, just this one. Uh, what I really liked was um, that this uh, worker we had mm -hmm. with the um, construction um, demonstration was uh, was there for a quick interview. That was nice. Yeah, <laughs> I also really liked uh, Susan's interview. I bet there's more to your story. Yes. I'm... Now, of course, then. <laughs> All the small cameo interviews are really good. There's also Corvin, who talks about his workplace being definitely not toxic, as Ivanova is looming yeah. for his shoulder yeah. and making sure he doesn't spill the beans. So, all of these short ones, are, I, I think, are really nice, are nice inclusions. But yeah, we don't have to talk in. No, we don't have to analyze all of them, definitely. Uh, when it comes to Jacquard and Londo, I think it's just interesting that they feel very much like they are reverted to their season one selves in that situation where it's just a reminder of we've gotten to know these characters so much in depth. But what anybody else would see is just the interviews, which is just two sides talking against the wall and just not making any new points. We've all heard these arguments a million times before because it's always the same story with this kind of conf confrontation. Yeah. Okay, so second to Jelen. Jelen, yes. She shouldn't cry. This is terrible. Anybody who does that did the interview wrong. Yes. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe I can find an angle to start because, um, I mean, we, we have already um, talked a little bit about Sheridan's interview and how he just noticed what the journalist was up to and was like, yeah, not opening that door, having his defense on, but also knowing the game that she was playing and with Delan, she had an interview partner who was not aware of this game. Maybe there is also interesting to mention that Wando also completely knew what was going on because confrontations like that, discussion runs like that, are just something that are just like a technique that in his culture is known. Yeah. And Delan, especially in her position in the religious caste, just has no experience with it and was never trained to deal with that. And it goes terribly wrong, I think, because she has no defenses on. She's not aware of all the layers that play into this conversation. Um, and yeah, that was brutal to see. And of course, she is 
um, especially with, with the last episodes we have seen, is in a really vulnerable state because she realizes more and more that she is cut off from her own people, but also from the human side. And um, therefore she is in an especially tight spot here with this bitchy reporter that is just going through with her personal agenda and um i mean personal agenda i think is is a good point here as well because it does feel very much like this reporter is taking out a, a personal vendetta against this person in a, in the interview but once again not her personal vendetta she phrases it and i think that is a layer jelen actually picks up and understands she phrases it as These are the hurtful thoughts all humans would have if they saw you because of the war. So Delenn is there really accusing of hurting the feelings of billions of people. And I think she gets that. That's what hits her so hard. And once again, this uh, journalist is just acting out this stereotypically asshole human, which I don't even think all of her listeners are. And I mean, just on the superficial level of here you have a person who underwent this massive personal change in you know matters of soul and body and, and weird prophecy that they have which uh, i think there are many reasons to be rightfully skeptical about the way that dylan went about this i i, I don't think that is entirely unfounded um, but it is framed entirely in this issue of like why didn't you consider how that makes me feel and like the the core question that you could could respond to this is why does Dylan have to worry about the feelings of a billion humans here? Like, and, and then it gets complicated, yeah, because she is a representative of the uh, of the people that were just about to bomb us into the Stone Age. So, yeah, yeah, she is in kind of a tougher spot there than most. But uh, like you say, it's it's I think an angle that she was never prepared for. Yes, but also now that I think about it, why should she be concerned about hurting the feelings of billions of humans? I also think that they show cast that this actually is is, is also also interesting again because um, if I just watch this as a normal human, I see there is this weird alien person, and it makes her cry. She has this empathy with us mm. that also shows this because she is not like yep yeah, humans whatever. It really bothers her and hurts her that she might hurt my feelings. That's also what I could get from this on Earth. Yes. Yeah, that's that also fits. But may, um, maybe back to to what you said, Alex, um, with um, yeah, the the whole idea or what were you were also getting in, Layla? Why should she care what others think? What she is doing? I mean, it is maybe this is just my personal problem with uh, with the situation, but. She is doing something to herself that has no direct impact on the life of others. It's, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm playing this down, but if like, um, I would get a tattoo, I would get, um, yeah, I don't know, an, a nose ring or something like that, that has nothing to do with anyone else but myself. I mean, okay, you could argue this is because cultural connection and and stuff like that. Like, um, but but I I don't don't see really the problem there because it's not like she is playing something down. Maybe it's it's also because I I know why she did this and everything, but it's not like she is doing this out of um, I, I want to harm you or I want to. Um, Ridicule, uh, I mean, ridicule you and and stuff like that, it, it, or like maybe a better reference would be something like black facing. This is something negative that is meant to hurt people, um, or I, I disregard you and and put you down. But this is not the intention here, and the the reporter is not giving her a way to explain herself. She just assumes you are doing this and this is bad and what you intended to do uh, with this has no opinion because mine is more important. But I think we, you know, if, if we start constructing 
uh, and the, the, this is ultimately what 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 this is about like an example from colonial history I, I i think you can get to the point where you see where this reporter is coming from like imagine you have your generic culture that got absolutely subjugated during the colonization era something that was like you know the, it was a british colony at some point and the local indigenous people got basically wiped out uh, and at some point then the 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 colonizers decided oh you know what this was a bad idea we're going to give up this colony it's independent now and then you know your ambassador to this country starts wearing the traditional clothing of these people that they basically were on the verge of 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 uh, wiping out i can see why this would be a scandal and why these people wouldn't be particularly interested in hearing this person's personal reasons for doing so i think there can be this idea of saying no no you are somebody whose job it is to interact with us an ambassador and you chose your personal reasons for doing this whatever they may be over the importance of the historical events between our two countries that's a problem that is not okay i can see where this idea would come from uh, but i would also see that in general the um reactions to that would be mixed there would yes, not there would course. both sides be people who would uh, be upset and those who would not be i mean this interview even in that situation isn't a solution yeah maybe mm, the the overall problem also i i just see here is that there is she doesn't give in this moment the the opportunity to give information or to or herself gather information it's just this this quick shot of uh you do something and i immediately dislike it and that's enough for me to make um yeah to to make a scene out of this um it, it it's like i don't know reading it it feels a bit to me like if you read a headline which is reading a uh, written catchy and it gives me an idea of something and the idea i get is something i i don't like this this is this is something that is is completely horrible and it's against my yeah, personal yeah. values whatever and i don't go in there read the article and see what is it about really and uh, but just cut it off with the headline and give my opinion where i have actually no idea what's going on and that's what i feel here i might I, I I'm so tempted to play the devil's advocate always. I'm very sorry about that, but or do you want to? Yeah, I want, I want to add something directly to to that because you say that we don't go into it, we don't go into into facts or any information or something. And I wanted to say something you said earlier that this is also just like just like reality TV. It is about confronting her, provoking a reaction because oh my god, now I have tears. Now my report got more interesting, and it is nothing about the real situation. That is true, but I do play the devil's advocate for one second, where I think this plays into the issue that, unfortunately, Dylan isn't, I'm going to say it, not that well equipped to be an ambassador, because the reporter could argue, well, the reason I'm confronting you like this right now and not giving you the opportunity to explain yourself is because you bait never an attempt to do that on your own. You waited for me to come here as part of the special report. Dylan in the very beginning says, this transformation that I'm going through is in part so I can build better bridges with humans, so that, that I can communicate better with humans. But we've never seen her actually make an attempt at communicating that to humans outside of the very small bubble that she is in. And... I don't, I, you know, I don't argue that this is a reason to lay blame on her, but I think this is an unfortunate misstep that she takes. She does give them this opportunity of, to have the initiative. And, yeah, I can see why somebody would argue. What should she have done? Well, if there is an explanation that she wants people to hear, you know, give that interview on her own terms, not wait for somebody to go to her and demand these answers. Question... How is it on uh, member or in the Membari culture with like, uh, yeah, 
uh, TV channels, uh, newspapers, and stuff like that. Probably um, very different. Probably from smart, this smart, angle, smart, she yes. doesn't have that. Yeah. But you know, she's an ambassador. Her entire yep. job description is to understand things outside of her own cultural context. Yes, but I think this is one more proof that we only see her learning here. Yeah. And that she and I, as I have been stressing that a lot when you are watching all the episodes where she was going through her transformation, that she is her whole being, even in her physical uh, 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 form, in her physical, uh, uh, in, in, I'm lacking this fucking word. Anyway, she as a whole becomes a symbol for all of the struggle and all of the challenges and all of the walls to run into while learning this, while communicating between species, between races, between cultures. And even here in that interview, when she is completely not up to the game and does not have, have her guard open and does not realizing the level on which she now has to interact or even things like she never gave an interview herself, she just becomes this personification of this challenge mm -hmm. of any intercultural contact. And I think this is also part of this metaphor that her transformation means. Absolutely. Question there, or um, it's, an, it's a question after that. Um, there is no human ambassador on Babylon 5. No, we only have no official, we have no official representative of uh, the human world or the human society on Babylon 5. What? I mean, the mm. commander is our representative in the council, so I think it's his job. Mm. It's 50% with his job. Okay, it seems a bit thin to me, uh, thinly stretched, because this is uh, like, yeah, handle the station and do the political stuff for us. Seems honestly a bit too much. I mean, because it's, yeah, it, it, it is two jobs, and whoever has ever. Uh, done this knows okay this is not going in a good way usually and um but what what i want to say is we ha there is no one where she usually can just go and hey uh, can we have a conversation about your culture and mine of course she can do this with sheridan um but on the other hand sheridan has his hands full with a lot of other things like uh, yeah just i mean they met for um for, for dinner once, but to really get to know a lot about a culture, you have to exchange um, more with with um, yeah people from there. And the question is, I are there any reliable other source resources on Babylon Five where she could have gone to? Um, maybe it's just a scenario, just I'm making up right now in my head, but. If there was like um, um, an ambassador for the humans, uh, then it, it would be far more easy to um, get access to information about, yeah, the human world, how it's working. And um, maybe then there would be this, uh, would have been the situation of um, like, yeah, usually we humans, if we do something really big, like you just did with your transformation, this is something where that you would stay in the news, where you would give an interview, where you would explain. Um, I, I don't want to, to overprotect Delen here, but um, I think this, this, yeah, why didn't you know, um, is, is always problematic. Of course, in, to a certain degree, it is understandable and um, correct. But on the other hand, you can't go out and and, and assume uh, that the other person or, or ask the other person to know everything there is to know. Um, therefore, this is a bit complicated to just call out someone on, yeah, why don't you know anything, everything about me and my culture. Um, even the best equipped ambassador wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do this. And there are more than just the humans on Babylon 5. Absolutely. And this, this does touch on this issue that Leila also mentioned earlier. It's a very imperfect version of the UN. Like this, what you point out, there is no human ambassador is a massive flaw. And Sheridan himself talks about that. Like, great, I'm commander of the station. Now, are you sure you want the guy who blew up the Black Star to be your ambassador to the Membari? That's a terrible idea. And 
it almost immediately goes terribly wrong. So that's that's 100% the case. And we see this with all the other species as well. I mean, in, in, in when the centauri and uh, nanvor started, we even very briefly talked about this. Like, do we really want Londo and Jakar, who have like a lot of personal history, to be the ambassadors on Babylon 5? Are these really the best people these two species have to offer to ever negotiate a peace? I don't know about that, especially knowing that Londo always felt like his assignment was a joke because Babylon 5 isn't taken seriously by the Centauri, as we see in this episode. And Jakar is this, like, you know, grew up in colonial revolts, uh, old, like, resistance fighter who is probably not on the best terms diplomatically to do anything. So it's... Yeah, it is not It is not just an imperfect version. It is a premature version. We see a lot of first cases here. We see a lot of uh, incident cases um, and have to stay uh, stay curious about what is happening out of these things. None of which negates the fact that I just wish Lanier would have been part of this interview to karate chop this this reporter to pieces yes. and resolve this. I, I think... Lanier has a level of sarcasm the Len doesn't have. I, and I think the Len has... An interesting... Especially with, you know, we've, we've seen so much of the Len's transformation in this season so far. And all of it has been about isolating her. And I think this is really becoming a problem now because she does feel like she herself has to be held accountable for this. She has to give this interview alone and such where, you know, if, if she had more people like Lanier that she can rely on, even if we are in the situation of saying, listen, there is no human ambassador. I have no way of knowing how to deal with this. She could then at least have the support network on the Membari side to recuse herself from the situation and say, I'm just not going to comment on this right now. I'll have somebody write up a speech that explains this better than I currently can. And this is also just missing. So it just puts her in a very bad position. So... In this episode, we definitely have this journalist who is trying to be the standard Earth citizen and ask the standard Earth citizen question, at least as uh, she thinks um, in her a little bit biased way, probably on how, what that question would look like and neutrality and actually uh, a, a neutral report on how the bi life on Babylon 5 and the work on Babylon 5 is going is not really the aim this report seems to have. Can we agree on that? Yes. But then I'm curious how we feel about the ending. I forgot about the ending. The ending is her asking, is it worth it, though? And it's this interesting situation where you've watched this reporter have this very biased view of being like, man, all of this is kind of a sham and, you know, difficult things happen and it costs all so much money and... You know, it's dangerous up here and there's fighting going on that Earth doesn't really want to be involved in. And still, by the end, we get this montage of all the different interviews asking, is it worth maintaining the station? And they all say, well, not all of them, but most of them say yes to some degree. The one exception is Shikar, who's just like, I, I don't know, it was supposed to protect peace and my people are getting slaughtered. So, you know, not that enthused about Babylon 5 right now. Um... But, you know, but if also not a complete no. Yes. And if this was, you know, your typical Fox News or, or you know, RTL uh, smash Babylon 5 to, uh, to pieces piece, I wouldn't expect that ending. It's... I would expect that ending still. Why? Because this question already is super biased because this question really uh, comes up uh, from the interview with the senator that we get who is like this who looks at this confrontation and says this is exactly the reason why we think the place is so risky because we can be drawn into another war and the costs and the risks and whatever and this has this totally isolation argument basically there on the, on, on the table and um, then she go is again, once again the super provocative of this is my tax money and I don't want another war with this kind of kind of kind of um kind of stance. Then she goes to all of our main cast and also the other interview partners and asks, so is it worth it? And then they give their points. And um, I, th I feel like all of this is still framed by the report of so your tax money is being wasted for that. Your children may be fight, fighting in another war because we just had an explosion there. And they tell you it's worth it because of. 
So I think in this format, it still has a good chance in the right target audience to leave a negative, negative, uh, negative feedback or feeling kind of because everything that Sheridan and whoever is there says then is like still so far away from 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 these stupid earth citizen arguments that they also bring on the table. But I think this then speaks to a lot of synergy between ISN and its audience that the persona of the ignorant earther that she's playing throughout this episode must be close enough in line with a large enough chunk of the audience that this really pulls in. I mean, yes, yes. I can also, if I'm not part of this target audience, I can see this and get useful information, useful argumentations out of it. And um, I also, I strongly believe that even now on Earth, there are a lot of people who would get that, definitely. Um, but I'm just saying that I have these segments of the other side giving points and argumentations, even in this badly done reports because yeah. they can rely on their target audience still jumping on their train. That was what I was what I meant. So in the watch something on RTL or whatever, I still have these segments in mm. there. Yeah, well you can you can what everything everything you hear or read if you have a certain kind of perspective, um, even if it was even if the setting is positive uh directed you can completely change this because of your own perspective of the world or the universe or reality um and therefore even if there is something um like like the ideal person would consider as positive as yeah there's still something good in all this bullshit that I just saw that uh, there will be enough people just to take this positive things and turn it around in their perspective to use it um, in, in their way which is happening way too often especially um, nowadays I think this is something that's really strongly present which I think is interesting in a way because it then gives I I guess a more complicated view of, of media than than you could do in this kind of story where it's not just saying, listen, here's this evil sci-fi space channel that tells people what to think and this is how everybody in society gets indoctrinated. It's more this idea, no, no, there are already certain biases in society and the danger of this channel is that it just conveniently plays into them while at the same time technically showing you all the opinions on all sides of the conflict and just spinning them enough that people draw the correct resolution from that. Yes, I mean, it's definitely not a completely censored um, kind of propaganda instrument. It's just done in a way that you can completely get on the wrong train from it. And that's why it's so annoying. It tries to be real journalism and people get to speak their mind even if they have another opinion but it it is done in a in a, in a weird biased format and it's I, I think it therefore also so much more dangerous by the made by the fact that it's the only alternative I think this is one of these things where if you can just switch the channel and see a different spin on the same story then it is relatively easy to get a sense of okay at least you know, in in summary of both of these channels, I get some semblance of reality out of here. But the fact that it isn't really an alternative for interstellar news, I, it just becomes so questionable because it is just close enough to real journalism to argue that there is no need for a second channel to exist. Yeah, this this whole discussion was rather or turned rather exhausting. Uh, since we had so many ideas and and points in our heads that we wanted to get in, uh, and um, that wasn't as easy as we thought this time. It was even more complicated. I think the most complicated episode so far. Um, therefore, we um, will end it just here because if we are exhausted, even you listening to all this and trying to understand this and getting together with your own views is probably more than enough 
for today's episode. Um, therefore, we will cut it short now. And as usual, you can find us on all the social media networks. You can find us on Instagram, on Facebook, where we have our own discussion group, also on Twitter, on Mastodon, but I don't post much because I have too much to do. But at some point, uh, Mastodon will live and I will tell you. Then you can also find us everywhere where you can find podcasts. But of course, here on YouTube, you're the cutest because here you can see us. Thank you for listening in on this episode and until next time. Thank you.